Thank you. Shall I start? <clears throat> Hello and morning, everyone. My name is Sikander, and I'm one of the HIM training. So welcome to Journal Club today. So, oh, sorry, I'm not able to see. Fine. So basically, according to the Mr. J, last time it will like focus some like highlights for before going to the journal. That's why I make the highlight slides. And last time I did the same. So today uh, I'm presenting on a journal club that is published in the American Journal Medicine, uh, American Journal Emergency Medicine. So they have chosen the topics. I mean, the title of this thesis was like transemic acid for the gastrointestinal bleeding, a systemic review with meta-analysis of a randomized control trial. So it was uh, done by the Pauline Lee et al. In, and accepted in 20 August, 2022, 2020. So I'll move the next. So they have made a clinical questionnaire like so the, the aim of this thesis aim of this paper was to determine whether or not transamic acid should be used in the gastrointestinal bleeding management so they have made the questionnaires like in the pico form as you know like p for stand for the patients or the populations and i for intervention c for comparison between the drugs and the placebo medicine and like what is the outcome so the population was like those patients with presented with gastrointestinal bleed, they have included that one. And the intervention given with the transamic acid, uh, it was like uh, oral, intramuscular, intravenous. Sometimes they have also documented like intranasal as well. So the <clears throat> intervention was transamic acid. And placebo, like they are sometimes given normal saline or they have not given sometimes any treatment at all. So the outcome was like primary and secondary outcomes. So the outcome was like a bleeding for the intervention needed, mortality, transfusion, intensive care admission, right? So these are the questionnaires for the like their M for the, <clears throat> okay. So background, why they have choose this thesis topic? So basically the bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding is the major causes of death. It's a life threatening in the emergency medicine. So they have make a plan like doing a thesis on this topic. So they have done, they basically like uh, transamic acid are used in the several purpose like following the operation, any trauma in the bleedings uh, like GI bleeds. So this they have got the before they have some review the literature and they found that there are a good effect of transamic acid in following the operations of the trauma. So they have chosen this topic to whether the exact what is the role can we use this transamic acid in uh, gastrointestinal bleeding or not? So the design they have selected like a, a prospective systemic review meta analysis with randomized control trial. Setting was like they have selected many randomized control trial papers. Among them, they have chosen only 13 randomized control trial. And the population was around 2,271 patients who were presenting with GI bleed. Overall, it was conducted from 1967 to 2022. So, what was the outcome? They have made the outcome like primary and secondary outcome. And what are the other conclusions? So we'll come this slide to the later on. But in this uh, slides, the author concludes that according to the available evidence, the presence of synthesis confirmed that transamic acid is an effective medication for treating the upper J bleeds, and that early administration of transamic acid may be worth recommending for the treatment of the patients with gastrointestinal bleed in the emergency department. However, the effect of transamic acid on the lower J bleed is remain unclear. So they have made the conclusion. That. So what are the implications? Why they have chosen and what uh, after this, uh, can we apply this uh, thesis, this implication to our ED or not? I'll come to this slide later on. So uh, again, Sarah, I have chosen this uh, like uh, tool for me to, for today's presentation, critical appraisal skill program. So the question one, 
did the review address the clear focus questions? So our question was like, uh, can we use like uh, uh, transdermic acid in the gastrointestinal bleeding or not? So I think they have made a good question here for this. So I say yes. For this, I've already explained the conclusion, but the conclusion does not mean that <laughs> this is saying yes or no. So I'll go for this one. So uh, if you go to like, uh, they have our uh, addiction, they have chosen 13 randomized control target paper in a patient 2000, uh, 20, 2000, 2,271 patients, randomized control trial. And uh, they have collected like, uh, uh, um, collected and analyzed randomized control to compare the efficacy of transdermic acid with that of placebo no transdermic, non-transdermic acid agent or no treatment in the patients with gastrointestinal bleed and the primary and the secondary outcome where the bleeding rate, continued bleeding rate, mortality, further surgical or endoscopic intervention. So I think they have chosen and they have done the S. So I think this is the S. Sarah, what do you think? Yes, I agree. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, any questions? I think it's a, it's a very good presentation, Spender. Really, explaining everything. Okay, so shall I move to the next slide? Please. Yeah. So this is our second question. Did the author look for the right type of paper? Okay, so I say yes. They have chosen the right paper because they choose many papers. Among them, they selected only 13 papers. So they have like a uh, search on the Google and the PubMed and the main different sites. Using the words gastrointestinal bleed, transdermic acid, lower GI bleed, upper GI bleed, or anything including bleed. So they only use the term bleed, 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 and transdermic acid. So I think the author looked for the best paper to find. So for that, I've already explained this. They have done the randomized control trial on this. So I think uh, they have done the, I think this question is yes for them. So the next, uh, do you think all the important relevant study were included? I say yes, because uh, like they have chosen initially 744 papers. Among them, one was like hand search and others are like Google and every PubMed and Imbas and everything. So among them, they have chosen uh, excluded like a uh, to 127 papers because these papers are look like some duplication. They might find some uh, abnormality or some copy paste from that. They are, that's why they have excluded like 127. Then they choose 617. Among them, 597 papers were excluded because 396 papers are non-relevant, that is irrelevant, and 59 papers were not GI bleed. And among them, uh, 50 papers were not in transdermic acid versus placebo, and 92 papers were not randomized controlled. Then they come to like 20 papers, the full text articles, they have to be, among them, they have excluded six papers because two papers are not accessible. They are not able to, even they tried uh, to assess it uh, by the contacting them as well, but they are not accessible. Conference abstract, abstract two and relevant document, irrelevant document, they found two. So among them, they have chooses 20, among them, they have chooses 14 papers. From, the, from 14, they have chooses 13, meet the eligible criteria. So I think this is the right, they have choose the right paper uh, for the this study. I think you are correct. They certainly went for the right sorts of papers and they made some efforts to find all of the important studies, but mm -hmm. with the suggestions on the checklist there, do you think that they ticked every single one of those bullet points? So they certainly looked in bibliographic databases, but what about mm -hmm. the rest? Yeah, that, that well, I was confused because bibliography, they have done very good on that. Mm -hmm. But the remaining other like follow the reference, they have not contacted the export. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I was thinking like, uh, if I can meet like one of two criteria, then that I can say yes, 
but i found there is they have not contacted even the who have done the like uh, like research who have done the, this thesis and everything so i was confused on this uh, so what yeah. do you think can i say well, i can't tell or no yeah the, the, we could do an extra box couldn't we they've gone most of the way but not mm -hmm. all of the way exactly and um, i th i agree with everything that you've pointed out mm -hmm. um, what they didn't do um was to look for go the extra mile if you like so they didn't exclude non -English language studies but they gave no indication of how they might have handled the full text in a language that they didn't speak mm, yeah, they have no mission, yeah. so it, it that was a bit strange not dreadful but at least they didn't eliminate everything that wasn't English. a lot of systematic review teams seem to do mm. they also their their actual search strategy you i'm glad you had a look at it for the term that they were using it frankly it was a bit mad um so they they looked for a lot of bleeding mm -hmm. why they then had to reject quite so many studies that turned out not to be on the topic that they thought they were going to be they got mm -hmm. rid of half of the ones they found because they turned out not to be relevant and that's because their search strategy was frankly pants so that's they maybe didn't find everything that was there to find because they didn't go about searching for it mm -hmm. in a systematic way mm -hmm. so they made three quarters of a good job but not a hundred percent good job not a hundred percent yeah i'm agree. not a hundred percent i was confused so so what can i do i can i say yes or i can't tell because they have not contacted they have followed the references list they are a reference <laughs> list they have not personally contacted with the export uh then uh non-english yeah they have missed the two top two things so i think i think you could say yes but it wasn't a terrific job Okay, yes, thank you. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Shall I move next? Yeah, please do. Yes, thank you. So, okay. Did the review uh, author do enough to assess the quality of inclusion study? I think yes. Because they have chosen their two candidates, I mean, their two parts, and those who are doing the randomized control time. So, they have done independently this study. And they have evaluated according to the like age, sex, bleeding site, disease, transient case administration, and treatment uh, treatment point, time point, frequency, re-bleed, need for endoscopic or surgical intervention, or trans catheter arterial embolization, continued bleeding, blood loss volume, blood transfusion, ICU admission rate, and length of ICU stay and hospital stay admission rate as well as the cause of the mortality even they like blinded the blinded the like a uh, um, randomization generation allocation concern investigator in blind the investigator blinding the participants uh, so I, I was not clear about whether they have blind the participant or not because this is the paper and definitely this is a randomized controlled trial so uh, i think there are some bias regarding the participant blinding Otherwise, they have done like everything in this case as well. So I think they have done the like uh, for the assessment of the quality assessment, they have done a very good job in this one. Okay, I've got a slightly alternative interpretation. They certainly looked at, they assessed the studies that they were thinking of including in a very good way. So you're right to have highlighted that paragraph because they used the Cochrane risk of bias tool the studies that they wanted to include so that's very that's very promising the thing where it falls down and that's why this is um why i wanted people to be comfortable with assessing randomized control trials before you moved on to looking at systematic reviews because it's only what can go wrong with a randomized control trial mm -hmm. what might feed into the faults on a systematic review so have a look at a table where they assess the quality so that's on page 273 it's got it's got a green and yellow grid where they're looking at using the risk of the risk of bias tool on all of their studies mm -hmm. there's a question mark over where they should have included all of the study mm -hmm. they didn't all meet uh, there was some variability in the quality of the studies and perhaps they shouldn't have included them all 
So they certainly assessed the quality. It's what mm -hmm. they want to do after they'd assessed it. It was like saying, oh, yeah, um, that bad yeah. one, that was a bit rubbish, wasn't it? But we'll include it anyway. And I think that is a potential problem. But yeah. you've looked in the right place. You've considered the right things. It's just that you and I came to a slightly different conclusion on, on what. So basically, I've gone through this. Uh, I, I've gone through the page number mm -hmm. 273. And they've also mentioned in some chapters somewhere in the paragraphs about this. So yeah, you may be right. I'm not, maybe I'm not getting the enough regarding this one. Yeah, no, don't don't worry. I don't want to throw you that it, it's, it's not a massive um, issue for the presentation. It's just a consideration when they've gone to the trouble of assessing the quality. Do they go the extra mile and actually say, well, some of these trials are just not good enough to include? Patrick, can you mute yourself, please? Or can oh, whoever is Hosting the Zoom can probably also do it. Okay. Okay. No, carry on, Sakanda. This is going very well. Yes, thank you. Shall I move next? Mm, please. So the question fifth is: If the result of the review had been combined, what uh, was it uh, reasonable to do so? I think yes. So uh, if we're going to tab, uh, table two, they have summarized their report and they have a comment. Uh, it's an every paper they have reviewed. So this one is a table two and they've also make a secondary outcome. Sorry about this. They've also made a secondary, sorry. Secondary outcome. So uh, as the like second, uh, they combine every like every papers uh, to their re uh, result. And in the table they are commented every single papers on the, what they find on that paper, what they find on there, but what are the intervention given and how much percentage was uh, and what was the relative risk ratio among them. So I wanted to know that uh, the, we also, they have also performed the like uh, transfusion, transfusion volume and number of the patients moved to the ICU. Nine randomized control trial transfusion rate with a total patients of 1928 patients. So estimated like similar transfusion rate, uh, similar transfusion rate in transamic acid and placebo group. Though. So uh, relative risk ratio was uh, 94%. So if you go to all the relative risk ratio, they're going to get approximately 90, around 95%. And some of them was also having like a, uh, 86 or around that. So basically, the, the, uh, I'm, I'm trying to explain in this, like, I think they have done the very good job in this because they have combined each and every report and they have come to the conclusion that uh, like uh, if we give the transamic acid in the acute bleed, that will be beneficial. So similar transfusion rate is transamic acid placebo group. Uh, Non-significant difference were found in the following groups trial, upper gastrointestinal bleed, the single trial addressing the lower gastrointestinal bleed, no significant, uh, no signifies the gastrointestinal bleed. A similar trend was observed in the old result for the transfusion volume and the similar ICU, ICU admission rate for the transient acid and placebo group. So I think they have combined the reports uh, for every paper. What do you think, Sarah? I agree that they it was reasonable to combine them, but I looked at different statistics to you to, to make my um, assessment of that. So this is one of the more difficult questions when you're assessing a systematic review. And there are, there's different data that you need to consider. Not, it's not actually the results that would tell you, it's how similar the trials were from study to study. And right at the front of your presentation, you mentioned all the different ways that transexamic acid had been administered in the different mm -hmm. trials. And that is a clue as to going to be different isn't there these trials are not identical they were not run in identical ways they didn't choose different you know identical delivery methods they had lots of different aspects to them so the mm -hmm. question is is saying was it reasonable 
to combine all of these very separate trials, were they similar enough? And it's making that determination that is actually very difficult. Um, and you have to, the, the kind of statistical questions you have to ask yourself for that is, how homogenous were the results or how much heterogeneity were there in the results? So how, how similar were the results or how much difference was there in them? And there's some clues to that. In so basically, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. So basically, I think uh, like I just go through this question and they have seen whether they have combined or not. So I've gone through this re result mm. only. But yeah, I mentioned like they have given to the different route. So I was, uh, yeah, they might make some like uh, uh, in the result, they might make some like uh, this uh, route of administration got this report, this route of administration got this report. So I think if yeah there are some uh, like bias as well in this study uh, but yeah i just think about the whether they are combined or not that's all yeah no i know and and the systematic review tool is a little bit bland um mm -hmm. i'm looking for when i was considering it i want to see what the statistics are on the heterogeneity what are the what's the results of the tests that they ran to know if one trial is similar enough to another trial to include them so we probably need to do a bit of a a session or I could send some um, like learning result learning resources out on how to assess because yeah, yeah, okay. there's some key tests and some key results that they give in the tables that helps you to come to that conclusion with confidence so mm -hmm. yes you're looking um you have considered this question certainly but there was extra data that you may not have been aware that you could also use so I think we'll I'll, we'll talk about how we can do a little bit more work on on considering heterogeneity across tests across um, trials to know if it was right to combine them. But we've come to the same conclusion. Yes, it was fine. <laughs> but um, we were, there's more things that you could be looking at when you're a little bit more familiar with them. I think I think the other thing is uh, kind of this uh, funding. Uh, I mean, when we have these uh, paper reviews, so. I think uh, we should be looking at uh, how these studies were funds or who were the, uh, you know, uh, uh, person uh, behind the funding, mm -hmm. uh, because the prime because the, the primary outcome, normally people keep straight, but when the secondary outcome comes, mm -hmm. then the funding these sort of uh, you know those stuff start impacting on the studies and the conclusion. I think it's very important to declare the funding of the authors as well in the paper okay. when we start yeah. studying and reviewing. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was trying to put that funding as well. <laughs> but I thought this is not too so important. No, it's everybody will really take primary outcome state, but when the secondary outcome comes, uh -huh. they start including other stuff like, you know, oh, tonic stomach acid better in uh, PV bleed and ectopic pregnancy, you know, like, like lower GI bleed, whatever. Yes, Mr. J. So we'll come to that top, that question on question number nine. Okay, fair enough. So we'll talk about that, like uh, what are the costs? So uh, so if they have not included any cost on transamic acid, I was thinking that if a transamic acid injection cost is 500 pound, so it will, uh, you know, the cost will be high. And if it is costed just one pound, so we can give like, even though in the emergency I've seen, like we are not given any transamic acid in the emergency department, but when like medicine callers and where we are referring the patient, they ask us, have you given the transamic acid? Then they will you know, ask- The source of funding, you know, the source of funding to the authors, mm. because when they do review studies, you know, so there might be some um, drug manufacturing or, you know, people who have got interest into that sort of product. So, you know, they might be funding them people. Yeah, I've certainly seen a systematic review on um, disinfection methods that turned out to have been sponsored by Clinel wipes. But funnily enough, they came out top. Yeah, so then the secondary outcome, they skew, you know? Mm. Okay, Sikander, that was really excellent. You made such a good stab at that. Thank you. This is all for my part. Happy New Year's. And I will hand over to Prozal Adhikari. Can, to can, I, can, I, can I make a point here? Uh, because, you know, it's, it's, I don't know about Prakash. It's my dream that, uh, you know, our trainee should uh, present something novel in the Friday lectures 
grand lectures uh, of the hospital. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, you know, Skander or Sarah, or, uh, I don't know whether that set of review, we could expand a bit further and present to the wider audience of the hospital. Uh, I don't know, they, they should know what we are doing, you know? So I think, I think if Skander, you are up to that, this is a very, very good study Mr. and very Z. interesting. You are just lined, lined up very, very nicely. Thank you, Mr. Z. Don't try to put me in more trouble. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's not at all because you know, that's that's how that's what it is. That's, that's what I've, you have to do. Avtar, to answer your question, yes, excellent idea. But the first thing is we had to make our own process very up to the mark. And Sarah knows it, it has taken us a few years. This one is very, very good. But if we go back to day one when we were presenting Journal Club, uh, maybe two years back or even recent ones, we, we were everywhere, isn't it? And Sarah had to pick up the right tool and then over the course. The first thing, of course, for me is our trainees going back to Nepal should be better than everybody in the country, okay? So the, if, I, if I'm, I have a vested interest in him, that is vested interest. Our seizure doctors, when they graduate in this country, should be a better consultant than any consultant in the country. So that is what we work for. But is it achievable? Maybe most of the time. No, not I all think the time. I think I think Prakash, Prakash, I think I think you are a bit humble now. Uh, to me, we have we are on that mark, and I think I think when we are arrived that mark, we should project. We should. And the, for the answering, I was answering your Friday. I don't think the Friday lectures are happening these days. It's, uh -huh. uh, if if it is, we can book it and then we can showcase our. Um, a teaching method in overall rather than yeah, absolutely yeah. Uh, and, and then probably they will they will know about it anyway i should not distract you carry on with the thing we'll talk later right let's let's crack on then Prajwals, you're up next uh, hello hello good morning everyone so i'll be doing the remaining part of the uh, presentation so i'll share the screen Uh, is my screen visible? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, well, uh, I'm uh, Prozul Adhikari, and uh, today I'm uh, presenting on Journal Club, the second part of this uh, meta-analysis on a tranexamic acid for gastrointestinal bleeding, a systematic review with meta-analysis of a randomized clinical trial. Uh, the basic part, uh, the introduction and everything was discussed by Sikandar and five of the questions from the checklist were discussed earlier. So I'll be doing the remaining five of the questions, starting from question number six. Uh, it asks, uh, what are the overall results of the review? And uh, the hint is to consider if the, it is clear and bottom line results, what uh, these are numerically if appropriate and how were the result expressed? So uh, as discussed earlier, 13 randomized control trials uh, were taken after excluding inclusion and, and in exclusion criteria. Uh, total number of patients were 2,271. And uh, meta-analysis revealed that tranexamic acid significantly reduced the rates of the continued bleeding, urgent endoscopic intervention, and mortality compared with the placebo. Mm, in the next mm, two, uh, talk precisely. This is the uh, forest plot uh, taken from the um, uh, from the meta analysis. It has given the analysis on several uh, several parameters, including bleeding, rebleeding, continued bleeding, rebleeding, and other parameters. So, first one is on bleeding, continued bleeding. Um, so, so, subtotal of uh, several uh, studies were taken among five of them and subtotal uh, it revealed total of 575 patients uh, it revealed that the risk ratio was 0 0.60 mm, with 95 percent uh, confidence interval being in between 0 0.43 to 0 0.84 so this revealed that the there was a risk reduction of 40% is so 1 minus 
Zero point six would be forty. That zero point four one would consider it as forty percent is risk reduction in the continued breeding, and p value for the overall uh, effect was zero point zero zero three, which is actually good for the study, and uh, it reveals it was quite significant with forty percent is. Uh, whereas talking about the rebleeding for rebleeding. Uh, from several studies, 972 patients were taken, which concluded risk ratio to be 0 0.84, with 95% confidence interval lying in between 0 0.61 to 1.15. Uh, and here, the risk reduction would be around 16%, uh, with p-value with only 0 0.28, uh, which is a doubtful value with 0 0.28. Uh, likewise, in uh, other parameters, including the surgical interventions, uh, the risk ratio for soft total being 0 0.70 with 95% confidence interval between 0.44 to 1.10, with p-value being 0 0.12. And we can see it is not very far from the mean line here in the forest plot. Uh, likewise, in any endoscopic interventions, uh, it revealed 0.91 percentage of risk ratio with risk reduction of 9 percentage and 95 percentage confidence interval in between 0.54 to 151. And for urgent endoscopic intervention, uh, subtotal of 338 and a risk, risk ratio of 0.35 with significant uh, risk reduction with 65 percentage risk reduction and p value being. 0 0.0001 lying very close to zero and which is quite a significant value for a study with for urgent endoscopic mm -hmm. intervention so these were the uh, results uh, published for the for this meta analysis so i think uh, the results were quite quite precise and uh, quite a good outcome for uh, mainly including continued breeding urgent endoscopic intervention and for mortality um, I thought that was really excellent. Can I just pop in there because you've got a fabulous slide that I wanted to um, to talk about the heterogeneity I was discussing before. This you've just done a really good summary of the key um, results there, but I can use your slide to point at the the couple of clues that um, I was talking to Sikandra about for assessing heterogeneity. This is the this is the diagram. So if you look if would you mind using your cursor to point at the? Yes, sure. So you've got the chi squared result and yes. the value after that. Yes. Those are indicators of heterogeneity. And the, uh, so you would look to that to see how different were the results. And in, weirdly enough, the higher the p value there, the yeah. lower heterogeneity for the chi squared test. And also the i squared test is at zero. So they were pretty sure. That the results was, were were the, the tests would be oh my goodness the individual studies were similar enough that the results um, have achieved statistical significance so that's not what you were saying for your results you were pointing out other things but that's the perfect slide to show the places that you would look to assess heterogeneity and it's 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 once you get into the swing of it it's really straightforward if you've not come across it before it sounds horrifying but mm. I uh, send some results, some some places to look for anyone who wants to brush up on their heterogeneity tests. But thank you so much for doing the flip side of the um, risk ratio as well. So pointing out the risk ratio reduction, um, that, was, that was really good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, for pointing out. So I will continue with the, uh, this was the outcome for the six, number six question. Moving on to the next question. Uh, uh, the question was, how precise are the results? Uh, I would say the results were quite precise in the uh, confidence interval is 95% and values were uh, given quite clear in all the parameters and all the readings. Uh, I'm not too sure about this one. That is how much I understood our, for this question. I think you've already answered that question extremely uh, thoroughly when you were going through the forest plot results yeah. and pointing out that the confidence intervals were given. Yeah. What, if you could go back a couple of slides, actually, we could just have a look at the, um, you go back at one more, so you've got several results. Yeah, you can, by eyeballing that 
I mean, they flashed it in blue because they're really proud of the results they found in blue. Yeah. You can just check along that line. It gives you everything you need to know about the precision of the results. So that includes the size of the diamond for their results, the meta-analysis in that neat, short diamond. It's not touching the line of no effect, a clear result, and the confidence interval, even if you weren't looking at the diagram, the numbers tell you that the, ex the, the extent to which the results fell is in a very short line. So the con confidence interval is short. It doesn't cross the line of no effect, which is set at one because the results are being expressed in um, ratios. And you can just, you can tell by looking that they're, they're confident that their results are in a very short so that's what that question is prompting you for. Can you tell if the results, the confidence interval was very broad, if that diamond was elongated um, and potentially if it crossed over the line of no effect, then the results lack precision. Yes. OK. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, going to the uh, next question, uh, question number eight, it asks, can the results be applied to the local population, it has asked to answer in yes, no. And I would say it's yes for this question. The results can be applied to the local population. That is what I think. Uh, as uh, in the results, it has a, quite a good number of population that it has taken. It's, it has taken 13 randomized clinical trials, including 2,271 patients. There is a good number of patients they have considered. And uh, other thing is they have done study on several countries, including the United Kingdom, which is uh, good to consider for the local protocol or local use of the medication. And uh, the other thing is uh, after the use, even after the use of such medication, there has not been shown any such side effects of the drug. So looking at the risk uh, and benefit ratio, uh, I would say it would be yes to for the use in the uh, local population. Sounds good to me. Okay, so uh, next question is: Where are uh, where all important outcomes considered? Uh, I would say yes for this question. The study has considered several important outcomes, including uh, bleeding, re-bleeding, further interventions mortality, cost effectiveness, uh, uh, mortality. But uh, one of the important missing point is cost effectiveness could have been included for this, uh, this meta-analysis. Uh, as I have not seen anywhere in the study that suggests the price of the tranexamic acid and such and that role to be used in the uh, population group. Otherwise it has considered ICU admission, trans, uh, uh, trans, uh, blood transfusion and the mortality rate and other parameters. So uh, I would say they have done uh, yes for this question. So one, uh, one more thing that I have not done, I think they can include a side effect of the transamic acid as well. So we can mm -hmm. get like uh, if they're giving transamic acid and causing some side effect, then we can avoid that one. So yeah, yeah, that is the cost and side effect. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for that. So uh, moving on to next question. Uh, yes. So uh, the next question is: uh, Are the benefits towards the harm and cost? Uh, I would uh, still say yes for this question, as uh, indicated by the study. It has shown that there are several benefits of using the medication but harm has not been much indicated in the study itself. So, and, uh, but the cost effectiveness were not included in this paper. So I would say yes, as the benefits looks to be more than the harm to the patient. So I think I have completed these five questions. Thank you. So uh, in the question number 10, Sarah, can I add some more? So basically the, I have found there, there are some benefits in this paper regarding this. Uh, so benefits are those patients get uh, have given transamic acid. There was delay in the endoscopic and surgical intervention was delayed. ICU admission was delayed and re-bleeding. There are 
they are, they have reported that there are less bleeding those who have got transemic acid so i think uh, they have got more benefit than the harm in this paper i think that was a fantastic summary by the both of you there i have nothing to add because you've covered all of the clinical aspects that i could have hoped for that was really really excellent attempt at that. I'm going to send some resources around so that everyone can have a look at the heterogeneity weirdness. Thank you. The only thing that uh, I would have liked to have seen, but it's the first attempt at doing systematic review and it's a different process. Yeah, it, it was like, you know, I've done like two before and that was so quite easy to just interpret it. But this is systemic review and meta-analysis is quite different. Mm. Yeah, you're looking for different criteria and until yeah, you thoroughly was... understand what can go wrong with a, a randomized control trial, you can't mm -hmm. assess whether a systematic review is done well enough. So it's a progression, but I was really pleased with thank that. You, thank you for that. So, thank you both. I'm really, I'm enjoying nowadays, like, you know, these papers, reading papers and everything. I like the sound of that. That's music to my thank ears. You. I think uh, because now this is uh, quite a clinical uh, relevance here comes as well. Uh, because this is the paper which deal with, uh, you know, uh, uh, a very important ED, ED sort of intervention. And, so, you know, you guys are enjoying. Uh, I mean, practically, tranexamic acid, uh, you know, we use to buy time, really, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, if you use it, so as we see in the study, so the urgency, uh, you know, become a bit, uh, bit less. And you can plan the further intervention, uh, and, and uh, resuscitation of the patient is uh, also, you know, happen quickly. Uh, now, now, I mean, I mean, this is a you know antifibrinolytic agent which uh, uh, work uh, in, uh, in in clotting factors, uh, you know, stop uh, plasmin, uh, you know, um, uh, doing the fibr fibrolysis really. So it's uh, stabilize the clot. Uh, so hence it's uses uh, to to uh, avoid the urgency in in the in the in the GI bleed and uh, resource situation. I don't know how much it works in trauma, uh, but uh, people uh, use in the trauma as well as the massive bleed in the trauma. And of course, uh, it has uses in the gynecological uh, uh, patients as well, like uh, you know, a muscular bleeding, you have uh, what they call manor hagia and these sort of stuff. And also, also people, you know, the dentist, dentist use as well, for example, tooth extraction and hemophilia, these sort of indications. Mm -hmm. This is a really good agent, uh, you know, as we've seen for the study. And I think in, in our patient research, uh, so I think we should be using uh, a bit more after that. We should remember, uh, you know, so it has a quite a good function to offer to the unstable patient who come with the upper GI bleed especially alcoholic and very still bleed and that sort of stuff, you know. So yeah, well done, Sikandar and uh, Projwal. It's a really, really good presentation. And I think, I think uh, you know, because when we begin, beginning, when we begin to have the review on the general club, as Prakash is saying, so, you know, so we were, I, I, was, I was pretty sure that we will reach that standard which is required. I think we're almost there. So yeah, thank you, Sarah, for, for this, uh, your input, really very, very good. And yeah, thank you very much. Sarah, can I share my slides once? I have some confusion regarding one of my slides. Sorry, say that again. Can I share my slides once? I have just made clear about this slide. I'm not clear. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Absolutely. So basically, for the implication in the ED, the paper itself suggested not recommended transamic acid in the patients with upper GI bleeding because the outcome of such bleeding surgery and transfusion rate were not reduced. Most of these guidelines are based on the current coherence review. However, there is also no clear time frame for the using of transamic acid relevant to this guideline. So the paper itself suggesting do not use transamic acid in this paragraph, in this area. But if we go to down, like nevertheless, Survivor, uh, survivor rate may be decreased by 10% with every 15 minutes delay. So they are suggesting give the transamic acid, but at the beginning they are, suggesting, they are recommending don't rec give the transamic acid. And uh, then uh, with no benefit after three hours. So basically they recommend if you give like in 15 minutes, there will be some benefit, but after 15 minutes, 
after three hours, there is no benefit. So emergency, uh, um, in the emergency department, the early administration transmix acid can be recommended. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm dismissed this one. No, this and is uh, kind of, this is the this the dynamic of the body is in. For instance, uh, you know, a uh, human is an entity. It has got a limited set of uh, you know availability of the clotting factors, whatever. So tranemic acid works by potentiating the natural set of process of uh, you know uh, because uh, you know the 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 fibrin is the basis of the clot. So you know, and the plasminogen comes in and uh, you know dissolves that fibrin. So tranexamic acid inhibit that process. So there's a limited resources in the body which tranexamic acid can do because tranexamic acid itself mm -hmm. is not a patch. For example, if you can imagine there's a pipe, there's a hose, okay? So you have a, like a little cock, you put in the hose and the water uh, leak stop. Tranexamic acid, not the cock, rather it, uh, it uh, encourages something in the body to, 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 to stop bleeding. Yeah. So body has a limited uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, what this are, store of the, uh, you know, that stuff. Hand tranexamic acid is not a definitive treatment, but it definitely by the time, you know, uh, for the surgeon, for the endoscopist to do endoscopy and whatever, you know. So I, I'm totally agree with you, Mr. J. I was just, I'm just trying to get a, like a clear concept because yeah, yeah, you're uh, right. Yeah. Again, this paper, not about this like transgenic acid, but the transgenic acid or what not. I'm just asking the Sarah. So I think I think what they were saying in the paragraph that you pulled up was that all of the guidelines up to this point have based themselves on the Cochrane review that they mentioned. Now it looks like in the references that that was done in 2014. So this particular systematic review includes at least one, two, three, four, at least four trials that the Cochrane review were unaware of because they've taken place since 2014. Mm. There's new evidence that they're assessing here, but wheels grind very, very slowly to move evidence into guidelines. So I think what they're trying to do with this systematic review is present uh, an, a fresh look at new evidence um, and I think they're suggesting that the guidelines are updated. Okay. Maybe. Yes, thank you. So I think our time is over. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Right, so our next presentation is going to be from Dr. Bandari. Are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hi. Can you see my video? Yes. You can see it in the dark. Oh uh, yeah, I'm in, currently in Kathmandu doing my health assessment. Is it so, dark there? Is it a night there, Kathmandu? Ah uh, yes, it has. It's been raining since yesterday, so it's oh, a little yeah. bit dark. It's also uh, raining here as well. <laughs> Like, I hope you can see me better now. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. So this is, I think, my first uh, presentation on the critical appraisal uh, topic. And uh, the topic for today is, <clears throat> let me share my screen first. Uh, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we can. Uh, so today's topic is the comparison of <coughs> intravenous ibuprofen and uh, paracetamol in the treatment of fever, which is a randomized uh, double-blind study. So for today, I'll be <coughs> I'll be using the <coughs> the C uh, the Oxford CEVM checklist for this study. And uh, uh, shall I begin? Yes, please do. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, let's uh, jump in uh, with the checklist. The first uh, questions that we should that the study should be answering is that uh, what are the questions that the 
study has asked about the patients. So primarily, the, according to this study, as you can see, uh, it has a, a total number of uh, 200 people and uh, 100 of whom were female and were included in the study. And also, it has been also been mentioned here that uh, patients is 18 to 65 years who had a fever of 38 degrees Celsius were also included. So primarily our patients were adults who were aged 18 to 65 with a fever of 38 or more. <clears throat> so the second question is about intervention. And uh, the intervention was done with the help of uh, two drugs, as you can see here. The patients were administered uh, 400 mg of ibuprofen and uh, 1000 mg of uh, paracetamol. Also, the, it also answers the next question that the, with, of the comparison. And the comparison is done between 400 milligrams of ibuprofen and uh, 1000 milligrams of ibuparacetamol. And finally, the outcome. So the primary outcome, uh, it, it has been mentioned that uh, uh, there, there was, uh, as you can see in the results, <clears throat> in the results, as you, uh, you can see, of the 796 patients, were admitted, uh, 596 were excluded. But um, among them, uh, in this paragraph, you can see that uh, both the drugs resulted as statistically significant reduction in pain. And uh, in the comparison of pain reduction rates of both drugs, there was no significant difference was observed between the drugs. So I think this answers our first four questions uh, about the um, nature of the study. So the first uh, points in the checklist is, uh, <clears throat> was the assignment of patients to treatments randomized? Now in this uh, study, uh, <clears throat> in, this, uh, in this paragraph, we can see how the randomization and blindness both were done. And uh, uh, it, it, is, it has been mentioned here that uh, the patients included in the study were shown and the number of case report forms were filled by the assistant researcher to the other researcher and corresponding drug was prescribed in the randomizing scheme. Also, it has been also mentioned that it is a simple random method, which is just like, uh, as we all know, like the flipping a coin and the different groups of patients were, uh, were uh, kept in different um, groups according and also the different, uh, the ibuprofen and the paracetamol drugs so I think it is a basically a very fun, a very a simple uh, random method of the study. And uh, yes, uh, uh, the assignments of patients to the treatments was uh, randomized. Uh, I think this answers the first questions in our checklist. <clears throat> That's now, fine. Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, coming to the second question, uh, were the groups similar at the start of the trial? Now, um, from this study, uh, we can see that <clears throat> uh, in this paragraph, uh, in the study protocol, we can see that patients with a fever of 38 uh, degrees Celsius by, uh, was, uh, the, sorry, the temperature in both the groups of patients were measured by the tympanic group. <laughs> Firstly, similarly, uh, both the drugs were administered in double-blinded uh, randomized conditions by a 30-minute infusion in both the groups. Also, the patients were followed up for fever at 0, 15, 30, 45, and 60 minutes, and the accompanying pain levels were evaluated with NRS, which means uh, I think the <clears throat> groups were... <clears throat> Uh, similar at the start of the trial, the only the only thing that was different, I think, was the rescue drug that was given, because uh, <clears throat> as it, is, it has been mentioned here, that it is, since it was known by the assistant researcher as to which drugs was given initially, the IV paracetamol was administered as rescue drug if ibuprofen was initially administered and vice versa. So I think only uh, that that uh, point is only the difference between the uh, <clears throat> uh, groups. Okay. So, Amit, did you have a look at the the table on page one hundred and four? So, there's almost always a baseline characteristics table. That's it. 
And so that is a, a snapshot of the characteristics of the patients at the start of the trial and then what happened to them. So it's always a good idea to check that to make sure that there's nothing between the groups that looks odd because the randomization method was extremely basic. And so it didn't randomize especially well. That's the, that's the danger. And you would be able to see that if the groups were unusually spread out, if you see what I mean, the, if the spread of these characteristics was, was peculiar. So does it look okay? Uh, yes, I think, ma'am, because uh, uh, the t according to the table, the demographic characteristics of the patients, I think the, there were equal number of male and female populations in both the groups, and exactly, um, I think, the 100 number of patients in each group. <clears throat> yeah, it's quite neat, actually, that the fact that there they are 100 in each, because then they don't have to give percentages. Um, normally, you'd see percentages and you can it's often easier to match up percentages across the two groups than to calculate the numbers but it's done for you here yep that's fine also, uh, so we're moving on to the next uh, question in the checklist aside from the allocated treatment where the groups treated equally so the best option here is that apart from the intervention the patients in the different groups should be treated the same like additional treatments or the tests. <clears throat> so as, as I think I, I explained this point earlier. So uh, you can see that um, both the groups of patients were uh, measured, uh, their uh, temperature was measured by the tympanic route. Uh, and also uh, similarly at the last the exit treatment of the patient from the emergency department was left to the physician responsible for the follow up the, of the uh, patient. And, uh, and this means that uh, after the uh, initial intervention from both the drugs, the, um, the concluding decision was left to the, I think the physician, which I don't think is uh, re explained well in this uh, study. But other than that, uh, the rescue drugs, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, different in different groups because the initial researcher knew the drug that was initially given. So they had to, I think, uh, change the drug. Other than that, uh, during the study, I think both groups of the patients were treated uh, equally. Yeah, <clears throat> I would agree. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and the next question we have is that were all the patients <clears throat> who entered the trial accounted for and uh, were they analyzed in the groups to which they were randomized? I think uh, it's a pretty basic uh, question here in, in this study that uh, there was, uh, there is no need for follow-up I think in these patients because uh, we are seeing the response of the drugs in two different groups and uh, <clears throat> Uh, and also, um, uh, we also can see that uh, there are no, there are there is no mention of uh, patients who uh, who change the groups as well. <clears throat> yeah, it's quite unusual. They didn't lose anyone. No one dropped out. Nobody switched groups. Everything stayed very orderly in this one. Yes. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, the next question we have is where measures objectives uh, or where the patients and clinicians kept blind to which treatment was being given. So I think it's, it has been mentioned in this paragraph that uh, <clears throat> how blinding was done. And <clears throat> oh, sorry, in this paragraph, how blinding was done, uh, as you can, we can see that uh, mm, firstly, the study coordinator uh, uh, come, came up with a randomization scheme and uh, uh, he used a, he or she used a simple random method similarly uh, and uh, the number of case reports form filled by the assistant researcher to the another researcher which means that uh, there were two assistant researchers right and one who dealt with the randomization and prepared um, the study drugs right and the second one uh, measured the drug effect and uh, so uh, I don't think the blindness of the study 
has not been uh, clear, well defined in this uh, study because uh, the one uh, researcher, <coughs> the assistant researcher who was aware which intervention each patient had and was involved uh, so that uh, he knew which medication to be given. And uh, this, I think, I don't think the blindness has been well mentioned in this uh, study. <clears throat> no, I'd have to agree with you there. It's a little bit unclear who knew what and when. Um, so we would have to consider when you look at the results whether that potential effect. So finally, the results. Uh, the results, uh, the first question in the results is the, how large was the treatment effect? So as we can see here that uh, both the drugs significantly reduced the fever. We have a p-value of 0 0.001. And, uh, and also there was no difference observed between the fever reduction efficacy of both of the, both the drugs. So <clears throat> also no statistically different uh, was found between the means of fever and pain level of drugs. And also both drugs provided a significant and similar reduction in pain scores. And also uh, no difference was noted between the drugs in the terms of uh, reduction in pain scores and evaluation of pain reduction in terms of time. So <clears throat> uh, I think uh, this is, uh, from this study, uh, it was pretty clear that uh, uh, the Mm, come between the ibuprofen and the paracetamol in the treatment of uh, pain and fever. I think both the drugs were equally effective. <clears throat> so, mm, uh, any comments on that? No. No, you showed, uh, just scroll down a tiny bit because figure three is really, uh, sorry, sorry, figure three at the top of that page. Figure three, huh? Yeah, go up a little bit, that one. I think that gives the best snapshot of, of exactly what you've just been saying. There's virtually nothing between them, is there? What do you make of the secondary outcomes? So on the pain scores, have you got the results of that? Sorry, ma'am, didn't, I didn't understand the question. Oh, sorry. Okay. So is there, have a look at table two on page 105. I'm just looking, you've given some good mm -hmm. on their primary outcomes, but they also were looking at reduction in pain scores. So those give you an overview. So there was no particular difference in the pain scores at the different. No, uh, yes, ma'am. It's, it's, uh, so it's just, comparison between the fever yeah. and over the time. Yeah. So the mean and median, I don't think there is a much of a difference. No, there's nothing. Yeah. It's just another way to look at the results to make sure because they're not expressing themselves very clearly when they give their results. They're basically saying, no, nothing, nothing to see here. No difference. No difference. <laughs> it's nice to go to the root of their confidence and see, right, is there a, a chart that shows it? Is there a table that shows it? Because when you write it out, it doesn't particularly have that much impact. So I was looking to see what the actual data was. And it, I know from for a minute, think that they are telling anything that's not true, but it's nice to back that the actual data. What about okay. rescue medication? What was the results on that? Yes, as you can see from the tables, uh, the three point uh, decrease in the uh, <clears throat> NRS level was about uh, positive in uh, uh, 78 people with ibuprofen and uh, 69 in paracetamol. And the need for a rescue medication was about 21 in ibuprofen and 26 in ibuparacetamol. So I think a little bit uh, more for uh, ibuparacetamol than the ibuprofen. And uh, uh, is, can you think of any reason why they would identify 21 people in need of rescue medication and only give it to seven or 26 in need of it but only give it to four that baffled me so, uh, I think uh, it is because of the root of uh, administration 
because uh, <coughs> paracetamol, but both were given. I uh, I don't think they addressed it. They just say, yes, <laughs> we found, oh, I don't know how many, 47 people that <laughs> needed rescue medication, but we decided to only give it to 11. It just seems a bit odd. <laughs> don't worry, sorry, carry on. I think, I, I don't know, it might well be due to the mechanism of action of these set of drugs, uh, because the paracetamol will uh, work directly to the prostaglandin inhibition. And the abipufan or non strategy will work through the uh, inhibition of the enzymes which create prostaglandin. It might well be that that difference. Uh, you know, uh, paracetamol is supposed to work a little bit quicker. You know, uh, if we go to pharma pharmacodynamic, and the abipufan is supposed to work a little bit like a delayed action. It might well be that uh, sort of uh, you know. Um, uh, difference uh, coming into play in this sort of situation. So they expressed a need for medication, but they were going to wait a little bit longer before they gave it. I'm not really sure. Uh, well, maybe I mean, I mean, because uh, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Look, clinically, what what we normally advise is uh, if the pain is due to inflammation, oh, mm -hmm. you know, so you can take paracetamol with ibuprofen. Uh, though the mechanism of action of these two drugs is is uh, is the same because ultimately same. they uh, inhibit the uh, you know what they can not see not, what this um, uh, oh, forgot the uh, the, the pain producing uh, stimulus which is inflammation and ultimately the prostaglandin you know which is a part of the inflammatory process <coughs> but the ibuprofen work through inhibition of the enzymes which create uh, prostaglandin and the paracetamol will inhibit directly prostaglandin. They also work through the, you know, the, the brain as well, the thermostatic control of the brain. So I think in this situation might well be the paracetamol work quickly and hence, uh, you know, the rescue medication uh, been given to the less number of patients. I don't know. I mean, that might well be playing the part. I probably derailed this unnecessarily. It was just, I was thinking, I'm glad I wasn't in that trial and wanting rescue medication and not being given it. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Carry on, sorry. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> so the next, <clears throat> next question is, how precise was the estimate of the uh, treatment effect? Right. Uh, <clears throat> so as, uh, <clears throat> as we can see, <clears throat> In our uh, results, uh, the both drugs decreased the fever significantly with a p value of uh, 0 0.001. So uh, there was no difference, and also there was no difference between the uh, fever reduction efficacy of both the drugs, and the time to reach the desired fever response was also not very <coughs> different. Right. Uh, <clears throat> the also the p values for the difference uh, in the need for rescue medication was about <clears throat> 0 0.149, as you can see in here. Uh, and uh, I don't think this is uh, much of a uh, significance. <clears throat> so I don't think there was a, a uh, there was much a different uh, effect that was absorbed. Uh, than the estimate of the study. So I think the um, the p value there, you're right to point it out. So it didn't reach statistical significance because it's greater than mm. five. So essentially, the, the number of patients requiring rescue medication could have been down to chance and not necessarily due to any differences in the, the actual medication. That's that's how I would interpret that. Kind of relatively high p-value there. And uh, I think finally, uh, the final question is, will the results help me in caring for my patient? And I think uh, definitely it will because uh, these, are, these two drugs are one of the most 
commonly used drugs for reduction of uh, pain and fever in the emergency department, I think all around the world. And uh, knowing that the both the drugs have usually an equal effect on the reducing the <clears throat> on reducing the um, yes. So as the, as the title says here, that uh, the comparison of uh, intravenous ibuprofen and paracetamol and the treatment of fever. So I don't think I think uh, from this study. The, there, there are a few points that can be addressed. That uh, first is uh, both the drugs are effective in reducing fever, and uh, some of the patients uh, may need a rescue drug, especially after the 60th minute of uh, application of one drug. And uh, I think combined using these drugs combined in a combined way will help um, reduction of uh, fever more in the patients in the emergency department and uh, <clears throat> and also in the in the context of uh, our country nepal i think that these two drugs are uh, widely available and uh, also widely used um, and uh, uh, concerning about harms i don't think uh, but people here use paracetamol very often over the counter drugs so I once had a case while working on the pediatric uh, uh, department PICU where the, the pharmacist gave the drop form of the drug. The doses was mentioned in the syrup form, but the pharmacist gave it in the drop form, which was very high and the patient came in with uh, liver failure. And, but fortunately he was okay within three to four days. So I think this should be used cautiously, but uh, for the fever, I think uh, both the drugs are effective when used in an emergency setting. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. That was a really good first attempt at that. Um, hopefully the process wasn't too painful for you. Uh, no, it wasn't. It is, uh, I think uh, it's a process of learning. And uh, gradually, I think uh, we will all be better at it. I think it's a very good um, approach at this. Thank you for. Um, so, yeah, no, for it's, it's a very yeah, yeah, Dr. Busa, a very good attempt. I think I think uh, you know the uh, when we read the papers, so we make a bit of notes, and then uh, as Skander did, you mm -hmm. know, so a little bit uh, copy pasting, highlighting. I think the things get better. Cheers. Thank you, sir. It's brilliant, Amit. You have done a very good job. When I was <laughs> presenting first time, I was so scared of presenting like a general club, especially. But today is your first day. You have done a very brilliant job, man. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Hopefully, I'm not too fine either. Um, I do want, <laughs> and anyone who contacts me before, <laughs> I will help as much as I can. I mean, the aim of all this practice is, uh, you know, knowing the science behind the things we do, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, each and every minute of a working, uh, working life. So that's what the main aim is. So how things work, what their efficacy is. So, you know, what other people are doing in the world, because the health system is, is um, a ubiquitous <laughs> set of universal set of, you know, um, uh, work all over the world. Can I ask what the current practice is in ED in Doncaster, say, for what would you choose for fever? I think, I think uh, you know, a, uh, paracetamol is the common drugs and uh, the paramedics are allowed to uh, uh, administer uh, paracetamol and the people also self-medicate as well with the paracetamol. Uh, that's widely used. Uh, but if, uh, you know, uh, the temperature is still there, then of course we use uh, ibuprofen as well. But uh, intravenous administration of the ibuprofen is not done uh, in the UK. Uh, certainly it, been, it, it is done in Nepal and uh, Pakistan and India and uh, most likely in America as well, but not in here. We, we, we used to have here uh, intravenous uh, uh, intramuscular diclofenac injection, 
but that has been withdrawn mm-hmm. as well. Uh, you know, so now we could use like a per rectal uh, route for the diclofenac and abipufen as well. So, uh, but intravenous route of elimination of abipufen and diclofenac, that sort of thing, is not very well received in the United Kingdom hospitals, and we normally don't use it. Can I ask why? I don't know. I mean, uh, there's certain things because uh, uh, they are uh, intramuscular, intravenous, they are quite irritant, uh, non steroid anti inflammatory drugs, and they cause problem with the stomach lining. So they might well be that sort of thing because it leads more of a thrombophilibitis and, uh, you know, tissue necrosis into the muscle, uh, you know, when they use intra, intramuscular. I think that might well be the inhibition not using uh, IV drug as well. The other thing is uh, uh, when we use intravenous um, uh, drugs, so normal sort of thing is the people are unable to take oral drugs because of their high potency to cause gastritis and gastric erosion uh, to by inhibition of the cyclooxygenate enzymes. Uh, <clears throat> and so if you give oral, then we use with the lenzoprazole and when we use intravenous, because they can't take oral drugs, we can't use lenzoprazole. I think that might be the other uh, sort of bit of uh, scare, uh, not to use them parenteral sort of route uh, for the non starter anti inflammatory drugs. But I think back home, I, I, when I used to work back home, uh, you know, we used to use it, and I'm pretty sure they still use it. I don't know. In, in Nepal, you have this uh, intravenous administration of diclofenac and um, uh, this uh, abipufen. Am, am I right? We have uh, usually intramuscular di- uh, diclofenac, sir. Mm-hmm. Ibuprofen we usually give orally. Oral, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in theater, we still use intravenous ketorolac. As yeah, the, yeah, the ketorolac, yeah. ketorolac is used. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I, according to um, Boone's excellent timetable. We're approaching a break period before we hear from Patrick. Patrick, how how long do you want to have a before you present? We can vary the break. Oh, you're on mute, Patrick. I think Patrick is mute, is it Patrick? Are you mute? There you are. Patrick, you need to unmute. unmute. Oh no. Patrick, you need to unmute yourself. Patrick, you're on mute. Patrick, you're still on mute. That's it. Uh, With your your microphone up. Is it working? I hear you. Uh, let's, Patrick. Have, let's have a tea break then by the time he makes Yeah, it. that's a very good point. That's a very good point. <laughs> okay, so we... I will pause recording for now. All right. Bring. Okay, fine. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So the, the title of my, um, my paper was... Um, it was a prospective uh, study in which it was uh, designed to determine the predictive accuracy of uh, blood test, which uses bio- biomarker, um, which uses biomarker, um, uh, what is it, um, measurements in order to predict um, intracranial um injuries. Uh, so the screening test was being developed to use blood tests and the reference standard was CT scanning of the head. Um, so I'll go straight into the CASP um, questions and so that I can answer as much of this paper as I can. Was there a clear question uh, for the study to address? And the, the answer is yes. Um, and the reason why it is 
uh, yes, is because the study design was to determine the predictive accuracy of a test combining two biomarkers measures, measured using a, um, a lab um, assay by analyzing bank samples and comparing with a standard head CT scan to check to see if someone had had, if a patient had had uh, intracranial um, brain injury after after trauma to the uh, to the brain. Now the study was done on subjects who came to through A and E um, as a mouth center involving 15 um, investigation sites in the USA, as well as um, seven investigation sites in, in Europe. There was ethnic diversity, wide range of uh, traumatic presentations as well in the study. So this study was broad-based, mouth-centered, and it actually uh, captured all the subjects who were uh, 18 years and above, we had presented in a &E with that kind of uh, range of uh, Glasgow Coma scale, 9 to 15, having non-penetrating head injury resulting from external force. And patients were enrolled if they underwent non-contrast CT scan. And the blood sampling was done within 12 hours of head injury. I think we shall come to that timing. Question two. Was there a comparison with appropriate reference standard? Yes, there was um, comparison with an appropriate reference standard. Now, reference standard is now the terminology being used uh, to say gold standard. It's in place of gold standard. So the screening test which was being developed was where the subjects were compared to the reference standard. And on every patient with blood test done, had to have a CT scan done to compare the outcome. Uh, question three, did all patients get diagnostic test and reference standard? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, patients had both who were enrolled for the study had a blood test and um, a CT scan of the head. The only exceptions to the rule were if the patients could not have blood tests done for some other reason or if they had difficult IV access or if they withdrew from the study. So uh, here, every patient had to have blood test and CT scan. Uh, question four, could the results of the test have been influenced by results of the reference standard? And the answer to that is no, is because the results of the test were independent from the results of the CT. CT was done by a radiologist, and yet you have three radiologists to interpret the results of the CT, where the blood tests were done in the lab by different people who analyze the samples. Patrick, may I interrupt you just for a second? The, this is a un, slightly unusual type of diagnostic test accuracy study in as much as they're using the sort of secondary uh, data in, in effect. But do you think that there's any indication in the paper that the scientists looking at the blood test results were aware of the results of the CT scan at the time that they were doing the blood tests? And if so, do you think that that would have made a difference? No, they actually um, didn't have any knowledge of what was actually happening in the lab. The CT scans were done in the uh, radiology department and the interpretation of the CT findings were mutually exclusive to uh, the, the lab findings. So they had no knowledge of, they were just presented with a patient who needed scanning. And um, it had nothing to do with what result they had from the, from the lab. 
Okay, because I, um, I wasn't certain that the paper was clear enough on that point because they, the CT scans had already happened and then the blood, the plasma was analysed at a different time. And it, I was unclear as to whether the, not the, you know, the outcomes of the CT, CT scans were already known by the scientists looking at the blood samples. But if you're sure that that was utterly separate, I will. Oh, oh yeah, that's yeah, yeah. So if you're saying that, you know, the, uh, the radiologists were told, uh, analyze the samples, um, the patients, no, no, uh, labs where I said, analyze these patients, the CT scans have been done, but it doesn't actually spell that uh, interaction between the uh, two sets of investigators. No, it doesn't spell it out, does it? It's just, yeah. no, thank you. Yeah. Your interpretation is the same. But it's, but, yeah, but it's a very good uh, question you've asked there, right? And then question five, um, is the disease status of the tested population clearly described? Uh, the answer to this is, is, is yes. The, the disease process of or status of the patients uh, described in this um, is based on two uh, criteria. It's the Glasgow Coma Scale and also the degree of brain um, injury. So, so it, it had to be either subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracranial hemorrhage or contusion. So there were those designation or categories. But then there were also two broad-based um, classifications of the disease process in the CT scan. It, the CT scan would just be reported as either positive or negative if it didn't actually show any, any intracranial event. Uh, and then question six, were the methods for performing the test described in sufficient detail? Yes. The lab investigations were described in, in sufficient detail as to how the sample, samples were uh, stored and analyzed and what methods, statistical methods were used to calculate the predictive values and the sensitivity of, of the test. Uh, with respect to the CT, they spelled out clearly that it was non-contrast uh, CT scan of the head that, that, that they were using as the imaging modality. Now coming back to uh, question number seven, what are the results? Now the results uh, showed four metrics, uh, sensitivity, specificity, um, and predictive values. Now, the results are categorized into the subjects where the uh, Glasgow Coma Scale of 13 to 15, and also uh, patients with the Glasgow Coma Scale of 15. Um, the sensitivity for the um, subjects with uh, Glasgow Coma Scale of 13 to 15 was uh, 95.8 with a confidence, 95 confidence interval of uh, 90.6 to 92.2. Um, the spe specificity was 40.4 uh, and the negative predictive value was 99.3 with a confidence interval of 98.4 to 99.7. Um, so for the subjects with the Glasgow Coma Scale of 13 to 15, this test really showed it had high sensitivity and a high negative predictive value. Now the implication of this is that um, for a test to have an, um, a sensitivity of 95. Eight, it means that it's, it's, it, the test, the screening test is able to spell um, accurately the number of people who had intracranial, had, had, had an intracranial event. The negative pro predictive value, which is 99.3, uh, is a measure of the people um, 
the probability of finding people with a negative uh, uh, intracranial event, or those who actually didn't bleed into the brain. Mm. So that's that's the the implication of these results for patients with Glasgow coma scale between 13 and 15. Now for the subjects of, um, or patients who came with the Glasgow coma scale of 15, the sensitivity was almost similar, 95.7. And the uh, negative predictive value was 100, which uh, shows that um, there wasn't a significant difference between people um, coming with Glasgow Coma Scale of 13 and, and 15. Uh, in the discussion aspect of the, the results, the study suggests that for patients with mild uh, traumatic brain injury and with a Glasgow Coma Scale of 13 to 15, in whom CT scan is failed to be clinically indicated, the blood test can detect traumatic intracranial injury with high sensitivity of 95.8. Now, if we go to question, question eight, how sure are we about the results, consequences, and cost of alternatives uh, performed? Right, we are sure um, that the results are reliable because they were actually a multi-center study. And they also involved, since the prospective study, it involved a huge number of patients, which is one of the things you find in a prospective study. And also the, it has got high sensitivity value as well as a high negative predictive value. Mm -hmm. Now, a high negative predictive value is important when you are looking at um, uh, disease states or conditions in which you want to make sure that you know you, people might be asymptomatic, like in brain injuries, they could have had an intracranial event, but they could be asymptomatic for a number of, of. So having these metrics like sensitivity and negative predictive value is quite useful in in. in determining the use, usefulness of this screening test. Results be uh, applied to your patients or population? Yes, I should think so. The reason why it is the case is because uh, the results actually, um, they tested actually uh, that ethnic diversity, age range, and they also had no, no bias associated with the way the um, study design was structured. Can the test be applied to a population, to a population of interest? Uh, the answer again is, is yes. And question number 11, were all outcomes important to individuals or populations uh, considered? Mm. The outcomes, yes, they were important to the individuals that were considered here. Um, and they were also used to improve the well-being of the patient. Um, would the knowledge of the test result lead to a change in patient management? Um, yes. If you've got a, a, a blood result, uh, with a high sensitivity and negative predictive value, you can actually probably avoid doing a CT scan. CT scans actually have got high dose of radiation. They're expensive and time consuming. Number 12, what would be the impact of using this scan on your, uh, this imp would be the impact of using the test on your patient population? So it would reduce waiting times and it would reduce the pressure on the department, uh, city department, and it would also reduce to be convenient to the patients 
and also avoid high dose of radiation. Are you concerned by the low specificity, well, low to moderate specificity of the test? What, what are the potential downsides of that? Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about the low specificity because uh, specificity um, is concerned with picking up um, negative, truly negative uh, patients in, in a test, in a screening test. Hmm. Right. Now, if I tie that to a high negative predictive value, there, I would be I, I, I would be satisfied if a screening test had a high um, sensitivity and a high negative predictive value uh, rather than having a, a high uh, specificity. I don't know, what, I mean, what you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you. I think it has the danger, if you use the, t the test in a population that hadn't, that wouldn't otherwise have an indication for a CT scan, you, there is the risk that it would increase the number of scans you send people for, but it depends. If you're choosing your population carefully to use the test, then I think you're, you're right. The negative predictive value and the high sensitivity are most important. I, think, I don't know. I mean, uh, in uh, our uh, group of patients, which we got an ED, uh, you know, needing a CT head. So the interval between injury and the patient presentation is not high uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, because I understand this, uh, what they call it, fibrillatory protein uh, is in the brain and it uh, is in the brain parenchyma the um, oligodendrocyte and these are cells which support the brain cells. And then uh, it goes into the circulation after some time after the injury or the insult to the brain uh, because it has to go through the process of, you know, information and uh, degradation. Uh, so it takes a bit of time. Uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, so I if there's a recent head injury, so it might not be present in the circulation, you know. So the other thing is specificity because it is bound to increase in other brain insult as well, uh, meningitis, abscess, uh, tumor, you know, uh, uh, I will say even stroke because after stroke, there's an infection of the brain cells and the brain tissues. So this protein will be in the circulation uh, but I think, uh, you know, uh, if, I don't know, if we aim it to decrease the number of CT scan in purely traumatic patients, so I don't know how, how long after the protein will be available in the, in the circulation, Patrick, have, do we know after the injury? It's, it's, it's one of those um, brain injury, but then there's a time interval through which um, is spe specified by these uh, studies. So the two hour period was the one that actually gave the highest um, um, sensitivity. So it's, it's, like, uh, uh, it's like almost the troponin, is it? Because the troponin yeah, yeah. start rising in first hour of the- Yeah, very right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Thing. Thank you for that. Yeah, so it's, but then the, the study was also relevant in the 12 hour interval and it is available as a as a as a key point of care of what to say point of care test on the bedside well that's the thing i mean they never told us about how expensive the kits are and and so forth but it's a lab based result which is based on eliza mm. similar to Andrew. so we have to send to the lab you have to send to the lab yeah that's it. But i think this one intended for, Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think this was intended as a point of care test. Yeah, because if yeah, we have to yeah. send to lab, then uh, we will be, no. I think probably yeah, so, we will be so, doubling the expenses to the NHS really, because. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry about that. Yeah, so point of care, because they, they, the kids were portable to be actually be yeah. done like within, mm. within the department. Yeah. 
is any hospital using though in the UK? Because this is, this thing is going on uh, forever, is it? For a few years now. Oh no, head injury and the fingerprint what? test, whatever. It's going on for, for forever, is it? Is any trust using yeah. this actually? Yeah. Not yet. The, the Food and uh, Drug Administration in the USA, January this year. So I don't think it has been widely distributed the world. Oh, okay. So it's not it's yeah, not it's a ubiquitous sort of universal sort of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's quite mm -hmm. as recent as um, January this year, according to the paper itself. Okay. Mm. Right. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to to mention is that you know when um, if you if someone could actually come with a method that can actually you know beat CT scanning, that would really be quite useful because you know um, CT scanning most of the scans we do uh, like in A and E they always come negative, but you don't want to miss that small bleed, you know. No, I thought this showed some real promise. It's just at such an early stage, isn't it? It could be applied, you know, in a lot of places where even CT is not available. So there are a lot of, you know, countries where, you know, CT is just like a, you know, a privilege to have it done. And I think I think I think the CT scan which we do in our department is, I don't know, is sometimes not not sometimes really quite often is illogical, because uh, you know we don't follow the nice guideline, and we are a bit defensive. I mean, more quite a few CT scan we do a little bit, uh, you know, bleed contusion, you know, then uh, nothing happens really. We talk to a neurosurgeon, they say do nothing, just observe. So in them uh, patient, even if we don't do CT scan, I don't know what the consequences would be. I think probably nothing because they don't require any neurosurgical intervention. I think we do a bit more defensive practice practically in our department. I think we have to move away from that because I've seen a CT scan requesting, oh no, people are just on Epixaban or some warfarin, even they did not have a direct trauma to the head. So they got a CT scan. I think I think that's something we need to look into it as a general sort of clinician and ED. Yeah. So according to this paper, the the radiologists were for any surgical intervention to be done, neurosurgical intervention to be done, there to be a certain volume of that subdural hemorrhage. So if it was more than thirty mm -hmm. millimeters, uh -huh. then then it will be for surgical Positive. intervention. Yeah, oh. so if it was less than 30 millimeters, then they would not, uh, it would be just conservative management. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's a good, good thing, is it? How did you uh, use in the tool, Patrick? You're the first person to actually tangle with the diagnostic test accuracy study. How did, how did you find it? How did what? How did you find using the um, CASP? checklist for this paper was it straightforward it was very straightforward and user friendly and you know it's quite so simple to you know go through that because they by the time you actually go through this and um go back to the to the uh, to the article itself uh, it becomes it's, it's so lucidly written you know uh so it's it's, it's very useful and um, it actually gives you you know you know, um, that latitude to introspect on a paper and see the usefulness of that paper. Yeah, now you presented so clearly. Um, I have nothing extra to add to what you uh, what you drew out there. So that, thank you for that. That was really good. Do you, um, did you do any calculations? Did you take your data from their results or did you, were you um, motivated to uh, do any of the, I did, I did, I did um, the, the calculations, um, yes, because I knew how to calculate the uh, negative uh, predictive value and the positive predictive value. Yeah. Um, so it was quite interesting to, to, to do these figures, yeah. 
Oh, thank you. You made me so happy there. Do you think that you want to share some of your calculations with the group? Because I've got a blank um, two by two grid that you could direct us to fill in, if you like, or could, um, quiz on other people. Yeah, no, that would be fine. I, Shall I, I create one here. Which... Do, you, do you mind? I can share my screen and then you can see what I'm up to okay. in a second. Right. Right. So I'm not, this is not a test for you, Patrick. I'm not intending to put you in the spotlight at all. Do you want right. to, um, to to populate it and then we can make other people do the calculations? Yeah, okay, fine. All right. So back into uh, the article. So that's it. Right. So um, what we'll do is we'll go to the... Um, index test negative right so okay so yeah right so what we had in this um the to the number of people with actually a blood test that was uh not elevated was 725 okay so over here 725 yeah so, um, and then um, the, so the, for the CT head, it was the same number, we were scanned 725. Now in the final analysis, out of that 725, the number we had a, a positive CT head scan were five. And those with a negative CT head were 720. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's on the negative um, predictive aspect of things. That's so uh, index test positive. So the patients with um, a, a, an, ele an, a, an elevated positive test were 1176. 1176. Is that okay? 1176. That's it. Yeah, that's grand. Right. And uh, so the head scan, those were the head scan were 1176, uh, positive blood test 1176. And then in the final analysis, those were the positive CT scan were 115. Yep. And those were the negative CT scan were uh, 1061. Great, we've got all the data we need. Okay, shall we make other people do the calculations now? Okay, that's all right. <laughs> okay, so. Now the total number, should I? Um, oh, yeah, we need the total total, don't we? Yeah, sorry about that, okay. No, it's my so fault. So the total, right. Now the eligible uh, participants were 2011. So, um, yeah, so 75 did not undergo undergo plasma analysis, right? So, uh, and uh, uh, those who didn't draw uh, were five, no blood collected, 16, withdrawn, 11. So in this case, the uh, were 1936. Let's have a look here. Trying to, I'm going um, to total them top uh, to bottom. Yeah, so yeah, sorry about that. So I think the total in the bottom uh, were 1901. Yeah, that's, that. yeah, that's, yeah that's what I'm thinking too. Okay, I've got to go in there. I will put it in 17. Yeah. Okay, so we've got all the stats in there. Shall we somebody calculate the specificity? I'll leave it to you to, to point the finger. Okay, all right. right. So, who should we pick on to do this? Uh, See in my Word document, I'm just curious now. It says I'm screen sharing, but what am I screen sharing? Right, okay, so um, just, I'm just trying to get a, uh, this screen to 
uh, press is is on. Okay, that's fine. So, so this is this is about the screen. I can see all my. Uh, yeah, so you're seeing my Word document, are you? I hope. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. it. Because I can't see anything else but that. You can't see it. Because what I'm seeing is your shared screen. Yeah, so where I've just put the figures in. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, I can't see any people. So do you want to nominate someone to do this calculation so that we can get the specificity? D divided uh, by the total of no's. All right, all right, second. No, no, no. Could you uh, scroll up a little bit? Looks. Like I do that. Like uh, I'm just seeing the negative part, not the positive ones. Scroll up a little bit for me. Oh, I'm just sorry. There you some go. more. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's Sarah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, fine. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No so the calculation for specificity is d divided by the total of nos. Anyone want to take a punt on that, or do we nominate under? Just use the calculator. Calculate it, is it? Use the calculator. <laughs> um, it would be D by B plus D, so seven twenty by one seven eight one yeah. times hundred. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so we're getting the uh, we're beginning to get the figures that we got in there. Yeah, it's just reassuring, isn't it? I always do the tests yeah. uh, well, yeah. just in case. Okay, so who shall we dob in for the sensitivity then, which is A divided by the total of yeses? I'll go back up. Tears, Patrick. Do you think we've thrown them? It's A divided by total of S's. It's 115 divided by 1176, which should be around 9.7 percentage. Yeah, that's lovely. There we go. So these are not too tricky. Yeah. Okay, yeah. for that. And the negative predictive value ooh, is D divided by C plus D. Let's go down because that's all gone a bit quiet. There we go. 720 divided by 725 times 100. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Oh, I didn't um, bother working out the positive predictive value because it didn't really add to this. But once you've populated the grid, you've got everything you need to do the calculations. I thought it was both a little impromptu. Um, going over that because Patrick had gone to the trouble of doing his calculations. I thought we'd share the pain. I'll stop there in that. That's grand. Sorry, didn't mean to hijack that, Patrick. It was just too good an opportunity. Um, You'd gone to the trouble very, of doing that. that. Thank you, sir. That was very useful. That's um, very impressive. I think I would like to know if it worked OK for you that I still choose the papers and pick them for particular reasons. So I was, I wanted to do different styles of tests, different styles of um, paper. And Sarah, I, we lost you there. Oh, hello. The audio. Are you hearing me now? I can hear you myself. Oh, that's I can good. Hear as well, yeah. I can hear you. Oh, that's good. Thank you. So I attempted to match a paper to 
various criteria. So I'm looking for something current that's relevant and is relatively straightforward to assess. Um, so if hopefully that worked, do you want me to do the same again for next time? Yeah, it was said in this one. And we'll do the similar mixture of different styles of, um, of study so that you're getting some practice in doing different things. I think, I think, uh, uh, where we are? Oh. Oh, here I am. Sarah, my understanding of how uh, we do the journal club is basically to intend to look at the article itself rather than the uh, clinical derivative of what should be done from clinical practice from now on, because some articles are just fresh and new, some are old, right? So yeah. it is just to dissect the article rather than to get the impression of, oh, let me let me use that tronexamic acid from now on rather than anything else, right? That's a really good point. I think that we're moving towards the goal of you choosing papers that interest you, that you believe might change practice. That's where we'd love to be. I think that not everyone is at a stage yet where they're comfortable enough with a critical appraisal in order to reach that point. But yes, that would be ideal, that we could pick papers that have the potential to change practice. But we, I don't think that they're quite there yet. Would you agree? Uh, yeah. Can I can yeah. so can I interject on that? So I I, I get I get uh, Suraj's uh, point about what a journal club aims to be. So if you guys want to uh, have an experience and an example of how probably a a, a well-run critical appraisal type journal club session could be run, look up the the Royal College the the RCAM podcast which is released once every month. And every now and again, they will discuss some of the latest papers and you see how they look at the paper and how it's relevant to clinical practice. And then they also then look at the various elements within the paper to look at whether, well, firstly, can they accept the, the, the type of finding or the, is the study valid? And then if they think the study is valid, how they then may potentially change practice. And that's a good example generally of how journal club should be run. So if you want to see how, what we are aiming towards with our session here, the RCAM podcast, when they talk about papers, is probably a good example of where we want to be ultimately. It's about journal club, I know is ultimately about how we're going to update and update our practice according to the latest evidence. But like what Sarah was saying, we are in transition because most clinicians generally don't possess good critical appraisal skills. And, and therefore, until we got to the point where we can critically appraise properly with appropriate correct skills, then I think this is why we are we have been running it in this manner, is to try to get to that end point. So uh, like I said, I think if you want to see how it can be run nicely and it can be used ultimately, download the podcast. I think the particular one that um, impressed me was the one for November, uh, where how they how they how they structured the the analysis of the paper and how it then tie in with current practice. I think I think uh, the the Sarah's is right because uh, the practice of clinician uh, is a combination of diagnostic and therapeutic. So I think if we have a mixture of diagnostic and therapeutic set of paper, so I think that will be good, uh, you know, because uh, the, we treat people after making a diagnosis. And if we know uh, the various sort of test which we could use, so I think that will be helping us treating the right patient. And also it would avoid the unnecessary request of test in the ED 
you know, like a bone profile and a hip fracture and these are uh, sort of tests, probably we might avoid that. I think mixture of diagnostic and therapeutic sort of review is really, uh, will be good in my opinion. That's fine. I will continue with that mixture. I'm really pleased Patrick picked this one up and did it um, justice so we can confidently do diagnostic test accuracy studies in the mix now. Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah, the, the next the next critical, critical appraisal journal club session is only a month away. I mean, this is every month. Um, and I know Sarah quite uh, sort, um, sort of releases the paper for analysis quite early on. I'm just wondering whether we can, we're in a position to get the three groups of volunteers already for the 27th of January. So him two, him three, and Caesar group. Any volunteers already for him two, him three, and Caesar from I today? Think, I think is, is, is any is any DMD training trainee as well present among us at the moment, no? Hmm? We boon, I think the him trees, it will be really challenging end of January. Ah, so okay. they, they would be traveling around that time or maybe uh, in UK quarantine or something. So we, I... may, we may have to do two longer sessions only okay. for this January. Okay. So one him, but I think uh, with him two, him three and Caesar, you said, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Unless you want him one again. But our no, discussion no, no. was, you said him one is, is done their part. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, him, him ones are going back. They, they would be going back anyway. So I think the main focus has to be him two and Caesar. Fine. Him threes will continue from February as as expected. Uh, I think him for the month of January probably would be difficult for them. I don't know whether they will be even available to attend. Forget about presenting. Okay. So maybe we can do two from Caesar, compensate two for him, three later on, maybe April, May time or something we can do. Or maybe we have just two sessions for one time. Yeah. 